Welcome to GP Trainee Teaching Lockdown Learning Session 7. So today we're going to look at hypertension, ENT, and just touch on GP job interviews after CCT, okay? So thank you for everyone that's joining for the first time and welcome back to those of you that have joined us for the first six sessions or, or some of them anyway, okay? So for those joining for the first time, very briefly, my name is Dr. Mohib Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP. I do a range of clinical roles um, and I'm also a medical director of eMedica. So my main work now is in medical education, but I, I do uh, various different clinical roles, which I touched on in a previous session. Um, so today we're going to go through three different topics. Um, it's going to be interactive. So do use the poll uh, when it comes up. Uh, do use the Q&A if you want to ask me questions and use the chat to get involved in the discussion. OK, if you've got a question you'd like me to answer, please don't ask that in the chat please ask in the Q&A because that comes to me in the order they were asked and I'll make sure they're all cleared by the evening, okay? And you won't see the poll now, but I'll show it to you when I show you the first AKT style question. So just a quick update on MRCGP exams before we move on. So the cancelled April AKT is gonna be held on July the 15th, only 450 spaces. Priority is based on CCT date. So majority of people that have been given priority are people who are due to CCT in August this year. Then people who are going to CCT the rest of this year. People CCTing next year in ST2s aren't going to get a slot uh, for the July exam. But there's a second date. August 19th will open later with larger capacity because by then, uh, Pearson View, a lot more of the centres will be open. So if you didn't get a slot for July 15th, bookings are open right now, by the way. If you can't book, it's because you're not being pre-approved. It means that you could try maybe for the August date. Okay. And then the CSA replacement, the RCA, the RCGP has confirmed that the re uh, recorded consultant uh, consultation assessment, the replacement for CSA, the temporary replacement, is going to run at least for the whole of this year. So CSA definitely won't happen for the whole of 2020. Um, it may start coming back early next year. More likely it's going to come back after August 2021, but that's not confirmed. In December, they'll confirm what's going to happen to next year. But I have confirmed there will definitely not be CSA the rest of 2020. So it's important for those of you due to CCT the rest of this year, maybe early next year, you're probably going to do RCA. So what, what else do we know about it? It's gonna be 13 consultations. They could be either audio recordings, video recordings, face-to-face -face consultations that are recorded on video, or a combination of the three, or you could do all of them in one type, or do two types or three types, up to you. First cohort, you're going to have to submit by the end of June, June the 28th, actually. So not even the end of June, okay? That's really quite tight. And we are going to be running an RCA masterclass this weekend to give people a chance to you know, get the most out of it if you're gonna sit it for this time. We'll run it again for people that are gonna sit it later. They haven't confirmed the next cohort, okay? But it's probably not gonna be till around September time. Key message, keep going with your revision, whether it's for AKT or CSA. So in terms of the program today, three topics, hypertension, ENT, we're going to do a, a, a CSA type or RCA type case, and then GP job interviews for once you finish your training, okay? And there'll be a Q&A at the end. So in terms of hypertension, this is such an important topic because we see it a lot every day. It's an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, it comes up almost in every AKT exam. And, you know, for those of you that are eventually going to sit CSA, if you're an ST1, for example, CSA will be back by the time you get there, okay? You know, there's almost always a case that has this at some point. Similarly, it's a kind of thing that you might pick to do a consultation on for your recorded consultation assessment. So we're going to look at both diagnosis and management. OK, so we're going to start by going straight into a question. I'm going to turn the chat off. OK, and I'll launch the poll in a few seconds. OK, have a quick look at this. The most common answer by a large margin um, is C, okay? Um, about 80% pick that, after that is D. Okay, so 
stage one and stage two hypertension. These are the two really popular answers. Okay, so the key things to look at here is that the clinic blood pressure was 160 over 100, and then ABPM is ambulatory blood pressure monitors. That's where you wear one of these monitors. It takes readings every so often. You wear it for a full day, and then it gives you an average reading. So the average reading was 149 over 94. Okay, there are two important numbers, right? Okay, so the clinic reading and then the average reading. So the correct answer is C. This shows stage one hypertension. So well done. Most of you got that right, actually. About three quarters of you got it right. About a quarter of you picked uh, D, that is stage two hypertension. And almost all of you that picked that, it will have been because you saw this number and perhaps ignored this number. So it's important to look at the whole question. That's a really important part of exam technique. And often you'll see this. This is very close to the threshold. Okay. If this was a uh, you know slightly higher and this was slightly higher, it would be stage two hypertension. And they will often do this that where the management changes or the diagnostic criteria changes, something very close to that, that's how they're going to test that you really know the subject, right? Okay. So let's look at the knowledge base on this in terms of classifying hypertension. Normal tensive is where you take the blood pressure in clinic and it's less than 140 over 90. OK, so if it's normal, you don't need to you know, keep repeating it all the time. It's normal tensive. OK, stage one hypertension is where the clinic blood pressure is 140 over 90 or more. And then the average reading, either by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring. That's what HBPM stands for, is 135 over 85 or more. OK, stage two hypertension is where the clinic blood pressure is 160 over 100 or more. That patient met that right. But you also need and. The average reading has to be 150 over 95. If I go back to the patient, you see, it was 149 over 94. If this was 150 over 95, this would be stage two. So very close to the threshold, but it's not enough, okay? So if that average reading is less than this, then that's stage one, okay? Severe hypertension is where either the clinic systolic is 180 or more, or the clinic diastolic is 120 or more. And then accelerated hypertension is where the clinical blood pressure is 180 over 120 or more. And then you've got either signs of papilledema and or retinal hemorrhage. So you're thinking of something more serious. OK, so they're the stages and classification of hypertension. Most popular answers there were A and F. So urine dipstick for proteinuria, uh, 12 lead ECG. Uh, but we also had people picking dipstick for hematuria. Um, actually, every single answer option was picked. Okay, so all of them have been picked except for C. No one picked urine dipstick for ketones. Apart from that, every one of these was picked by at least one person. Okay, in fact, by at least a few people. Okay, good. So the correct answers are B and F. Okay. So as I mentioned, this is a multiple best answer. You have to get them both right to get the one mark. So hardly any of you would have got a mark because only 4% of people picked B. So even though most of you got F, okay, um, a lot of you didn't also pick B. Or it might be that it didn't allow you to pick two. Is that right? Okay, if it didn't allow you to pick two and you had in your mind B and F, you would have got the mark in the real exam. Okay, so you would need both though in the exam. In a multiple best answer, if you get one right and one wrong, you won't get half a mark, you just get nothing. OK, so before I go through what all the things are, I'll open up the chat. What are the other investigations that are recommended for someone newly diagnosed with hypertension in the current NICE guidelines, NICE 2019? Type that into the chat. But what are the different things that we want to test them for? OK, so people putting in use and ease, um, albumin creatinine ratio, Q risk, 
cholesterol, lipids, ACR, urine electrolytes, uh, lipids, renal function, glucose, ECG, TFTs, blood sugars. Okay, so lots of different answers. A lot of them are correct. Uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of things and I'm going to go back to the question in a minute just to show you something really important in technique. Okay, so if we go back to the question, a lot of people picked urine dipstick for proteinuria. And I can almost guarantee that's because you just saw proteinuria and you didn't actually read this. Proteinuria, proteinuria is really, really important. And looking at albumin creatinine ratio is really important. But you can't actually do that from a urine dipstick. What you need to do is take a lab urine sample and send it to the lab for proteinuria and albumin creatinine ratio. Whereas using a dipstick to pick up blood for hematuria, that's fine, it's accurate and it's recommended. So you, you basically take the urine, dip it, check for hematuria, then send the rest of the sample off to check for proteinuria and albumin creatinine ratio at the lab. That's why A was incorrect. A urine dipstick is not recommended because it's not accurate for proteinuria. You need to send it to the lab for that, okay? For the ACR and the proteinuria. It's fine for hematuria, okay? And then, quite a few people have picked referral for retinal photography again you want to do fundoscopy because you do want to look to see they might already have some hypertensive hypertensive retinopathy some signs of that right okay but you don't need to refer for retinal photography we will just do that in practice with your fundoscope and then if you saw something then you might you know want to get some images okay but otherwise we just do it ourselves okay so let's go through the things that we need. This is what the NICE guidelines recommend. So there's a lot of additional tests that weren't in the old guideline actually. And then they always test these things. So the things that we should do, urine for hematuria, just do that with a dipstick, then send that sample off to the lab for albumin creatinine ratio and for proteinuria. You can't do that accurately from a dipstick. Send bloods off for knees and EGFR, for HbA1c and for lipids. So a lot of you picked those, so, so well done. Do fundoscopy. So you just do that in clinic for hypertensive retinopathy and then do a 12 lead. So can you can see, we can do all of these, take the blood ourselves, you know, send the sample off, do the fundoscopy. You can see we could do all of this in primary care and then the, the results will come back from the lab for the ACR proteinuria and for these bloods. And then if we see anything that makes us think, okay, they've got additional risk factors. You know, we pick up their diabetes, for example, or did we pick up that they've got uh, something funny on the ECG, then we might refer them to cardiology for further uh, workup and things like that, okay? So really important there to highlight exam technique. A lot of you that got part of that question wrong, it's not because of a lack of knowledge. Like you knew that proteinuria is important, but it's reading the question and reading the answer options carefully. So you pick up, and this is sometimes these small things in exam technique that lead someone to lose some marks. That could be the difference between pass and fail, okay? So now we're gonna do three extended matching questions. Extended matching questions in the exam comes in, come in sets of two, three, four, or five. For each set, the answer options are always the same things to choose from, but the scenario changes, only one question on each screen. So you're gonna do all three questions in one go, write down your answer on paper, the chat and the poll will be closed, okay? Just turn the chat off for a minute um, while we do this. Um, and then I will come back and go through, it's because you'll see if I went through the answer of the first one before I gave you the second question, it might give the answer away. You wouldn't have that benefit in the exam. So I'm gonna just give you all three to do in one go. Yeah, let me just, uh, Turn my camera off so there's no distractions. Okay, so you're going to do all three in one go. Okay, here we go.
we're just going to go through each one now and we'll go through the answer and the teaching okay so i will launch the poll all right um just give me a second or so please don't shout out the answer um you know don't type it into the chat or the q a okay so don't think about this you've already done it i'm just enabling the poll okay so um, let me just relaunch it right there we are so feel free to put that away now the thing is there key things to look at this patient is of nigerian heritage you'll see why that's important later okay it's got stage one hypertension q risk is 8.5 percent. so we're going to recommend lifestyle changes that we recommend for every patient with hypertension we'll talk about which lifestyle changes in a minute but what else okay so the, the options are there and so range of answers picked there the most popular answer was c prescribed 2.5 milligrams of indapamide daily okay so indapamide what type of drug is indapamide put that into the chat is it an ace inhibitor is it an arb is it a calcium channel blocker is it a thiazide like diuretic is it you know something else uh, what type of drug is indapamide that was the most popular answer by a huge margin but 80 percent of you picked that after that the next most common one was d amlodipine okay um so yeah absolutely so indapamide is a thiazide like diuretic it's not a thiazide diuretic there is a difference between thiazides and thiazide like diuretics bendroflumathiazide is a thiazide indapamide is a thiazide like diuretic thiazides are not recommended thiazide like diuretics are recommended in some patients okay so the correct answer here is a uh, he doesn't need any drug treatment and why is that because he's got stage one hypertension okay and his Q risk is eight and a half percent. So in a patient who's got stage one, um, if they don't have other cardiovascular disease risk factors, like he's not diabetic, he's not uh, got chronic kidney disease, he's not, uh, then you look at Q risk. If the Q risk is less than 10%, then you don't stop medication. You just go with um, lifestyle changes and see how they get on. If the Q risk is more than 10%, 10% plus, then you'd start drugs. Now, this particular type of question where the answer is not to do anything, the examiners have highlighted a lot of doctors when they sit the exam, they're scared to say do nothing. They always feel I've got to do something. But often in real life general practice and therefore in the exam, whether it's the RCA, CSA or AKT, the right answer is not to do anything. Let nature take its course. We don't always add things by giving people medication. Remember, giving medication, there's a risk. OK, so the right answer here, we don't need anything. Why? Because the Q risk is less than 10 percent. Okay, good. He hasn't got any other risk factors. Okay, second one. Again, I'm going to relaunch the poll. And that's time. Don't worry if you've not uh, finished, you've not had time. It's fine. Okay. Um, okay, good. So the most popular answers here were D and E. Either calcium channel blocker, amlodipine, or lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. Okay, so D and E, these were the two really popular answers. About 50% picked amlodipine, about 40% picked. Uh, uh, lisinopril okay so here this patient's diabetic so even though the q risk is less than 10 percent because he's got diabetes and then even if he wasn't diabetic because he's got stage two hypertension stage two we treat everyone with drugs regardless of other risk factors okay so he's going to need medication but the fact that he's diabetic is important why because it's going to decide which drug we give him okay so the correct answer you'd give him lisinopril an ACE inhibitor why because he's diabetic Otherwise, if someone was 55 plus, generally we'd give them a calcium channel blocker, wouldn't we? But if you're diabetic, regardless of age, you're going to be started on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB as first line. For most patients, it's an ACE inhibitor. OK, so E is the right answer. OK, um, lisinopril. OK, last one. Let me. OK, good. So here again, the two popular answers are, are D and E. So D, amlodipine calcium channel blocker, E, lisinopril, um, ACE inhibitor. Again, the, the two really popular answers, okay? Um, slightly more this time picked lisinopril. So here this patient has got diabetes, and then they've also got stage two hypertension, and they're 55. Q risk is 12.9%. This patient's Caucasian. So the right answer here is also lisinopril. Now, something about this, again, why I've included this, I just wanted to highlight another bit of technique. It's what I call the EMQ trap. Some doctors, and I guarantee if I open up the chat, oh, it is open, I guarantee there's at least a couple of you that are on this webinar today that actually thought, you know what, I think the answer is lisinopril because they're diabetic and so they need to have an ACE inhibitor and they're not Afro-Caribbean, so it doesn't need to be an ARB. So I'm going to, but then, then you would have thought, wait a second, didn't I just put, and in the real exam, you would have clicked previous and said, 
Yeah, I just put E for the last one. Why would they put two E's in a row? I think they're trying to get me. And you will have changed a good answer for a bad one. So you would have changed E to D and you just lost yourself a mark. Why did you lose yourself a mark? Because you don't have confidence in your own knowledge. This is really, really important for doing well in the exam. I'm going to let you into a huge secret. Everything in the world is easy when you know it. Before you know it, everything's difficult. All right. But when you know something, it's straightforward. OK. And so really, really important to um, uh, have that confidence that if you think something's easy, it's because you read it or you've previously done a question on it or that you've you know, got that knowledge and you really understand the subject, then don't look for patterns. No one's out to get you. We want you to pass. OK, we want you to get your CCT and come and help us at the front line. OK, no one's out to get you except the person sitting in your chair. So if the answer is E for all three in an EMQ, put down E for all three of them. You can use the same answer once, more than once, or not all at all. Do not go looking for, you know, uh, conspiracies. Someone's trying to get me. No one's trying to get you. Okay. So let's look at hypertension management. First thing is lifestyle modification we recommend for all patients. Just type in the ch chat while I'm going through this slide, what are the lifestyle modifications we'd recommend to all patients with hypertension? Okay. So then in terms of medication, stage one, we treat if they've got raised cardiovascular disease. So either their, their Q risk, their 10 year CVD risk is 10% or more, or they've got existing cardiovascular disease. They've already had a heart attack. They've already had a stroke. They've already had a TIA. Or they've got target organ damage. So they've got retinopathy. Or they've got diabetes. That's new in the latest guideline. Or they've got CKD. Again, that's also new in the latest guideline. Now that's for patients under 80. 80 and above, Think about drugs, just if their BP is 150 over 90 or more in clinic, even if their Q risk is lower than 10%, you'd think about it. Stage two, give drugs to everyone. Severe hypertension, give drugs even before you confirm the diagnosis with the average readings, because it's that high that the risk is greater. OK, and then accelerated, you're thinking about, you know, people, if they've got very high blood pressure, 180 over 120 or more, and then they've got papillary edema or retinal hemorrhage, you're thinking about things like pheochromocytoma, you're thinking about malignant hypertension, you're thinking about brain tumors, you're thinking about other things, right? You might either admit those or send them in, depending on how unwell they are. OK, so let's look at what people have said in terms of the lifestyle modification. So healthy diet, great. Reduce salt intake to less than six grams a day. OK, um, if they're overweight or obese, get to a healthy weight. If they're drinking excessively, cut down on alcohol, smoking cessation. If they're smokers, doing regular exercise at least half an hour, five times a week. OK, so these are the things that we're going to tell them. Healthy exercise, healthy diet, smoking cessation, you know, reduce alcohol if they're drinking a lot um, and then reducing salt to less than six grams. OK. Great. Well done. They're the mainstay. So let's look at the actual algorithm for hypertension. OK. And there's a sequence that you should think about. The first question to ask yourself is, is the patient diabetic? Because if they're diabetic, you don't need to worry about their age. They're always going to need an A drug. So an A drug is an ACE inhibitor for most patients, but it's an Afro-Caribbean patient. It's an ARB first line. OK. If they're not diabetic, the next question to ask is are they Afro-Caribbean? The guideline considers them Afro-Caribbean if both parents are of African or Caribbean heritage. That's why you'll see sometimes they'll describe in the question, the father is Jamaican, the mother is Sri Lankan. That would not be someone that's considered Afro-Caribbean by the guideline. If someone's of mixed heritage, one parent's Afro-Caribbean, but one's not, the risk genetically is the same as someone Caucasian. So you wouldn't consider them Afro-Caribbean. They might consider themselves Afro-Caribbean. I'm talking about what the guideline considers. OK, if both parents are of African or Caribbean heritage and the patient's considered Afro-Caribbean and they're not diabetic, then again, it doesn't matter about their age. It's going to be a calcium channel blocker. So they're not diabetic. They're not Afro-Caribbean. Then you need to ask about age. Now, if they're under 55, you're going to start them on an ACE inhibitor. If they're 55 or more, you're going to start them on a calcium channel blocker. Whichever one you start, optimize it. Once you've optimized it, second step, this is big change in the current guideline. You can add either of the other classes. So if they were on an ACE inhibitor, you've optimized that. So you started on lisinopril 10, gone to lisinopril 20, maybe even gone to 40, or even at 20, you might think, okay, not responding. I might like to add a second drug. At the second step, you could either add a calcium channel blocker or a thiazide like diuretic. Similarly here, they were on a calcium channel blocker here, optimize that. They were on amlodipine 5, you take them to amlodipine 10. Now you could either add an ACE inhibitor or a thiazide like diuretic. The guideline doesn't prefer one over the other. Optimize 
two drugs at step two. Step three, they're on all three classes. An A-class drug, so an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, a calcium channel blocker, and a thiazide-like diuretic. That word's really important. Thiazide-like means things like indapamide. It does not mean bendroflumathiazide, which is a thiazide, not a thiazide-like diuretic. Step four, you've optimized all three of these. Add in more diuretics like spironolactone. Add in an alpha blocker. Add in a beta blocker. Still not responding. They've got resistant hypertension. Refer them into hospital. Okay. A couple of special cases, and some of these have come up in recent exams. If someone's diabetic and they've got hypertension, first line is always an A drug. So an ACE inhibitor for most patients. But if they're Afro-Caribbean and they're diabetic, go straight to ARB. Because Afro-Caribbean patients, if they ever need an A drug, you should go straight to ARB because the latest research suggests that they respond better. Okay. If someone's pregnant or actively trying to become pregnant, the key thing to avoid is ACE or ARB. These are not safe. So let's say you've got someone who's on a calcium channel blocker and they now become pregnant or they say, I'd like to start you know, uh, a family. I'm actively going to try to get pregnant. If they're well controlled on a calcium channel blocker, it's safe. You can keep them on it. If they're not on anything or if they're on an ACE inhibitor and you're going to change them to something, change them or start them on labetalol if you're starting new treatment. Okay. Right. So just before we move on to do a, a case, a CSA style, a consulting style case, and we'll do a few more questions to look at ENT. I just want to tell you about a couple of things for AKT. And I want you to remember the number 50 today. Okay. So on the 13th of June, the Royal College has asked me to run a, a, an AKT masterclass, a half day. It's booked directly via the RCGP website. It's been really popular. It's sold out. And we had a huge waiting list. So we asked if they'd open a few more spaces. They've opened a few more spaces now. So it's going to be a half day from 1.30 to 5.45 on the 13th of June. Okay. Um, it's only 50 pounds. It's been heavily, heavily subsidized because the Royal College is trying to help as many people. It's particularly aimed at people that plan to sit for the July or the August exam, but it is actually open to anyone that's a trainee. Okay, so we're going to cover some questions from admin stats clinical. We're going to look at why people fail and how to avoid it, effective strategies for revision. And then we're going to do a teaching mini mock in timed conditions, go through answers and teaching um, and, and so on. Okay, so the bookings for this are via the Royal College website. Okay, so you book directly on the RCGP website. If you just type RCGP, MRCGP, AKT course or something like that, okay, um, it should come up. Okay, so for example, here we are. This is the RCGP website, okay? Um, MRCGP courses, it's right here, okay? So four hours, 15 minutes on the 13th. Just click that, and then you just click register. 130 to 545, it's just 50 pounds, okay? Um, that, as I said, it was actually fully booked last week. We asked them to open a few more spaces, so it may well fully book again. It's just 50 pounds, okay, for a half day. And then I'm running our full day AKT preparation course, which covers all three domains, has three teaching mocks, high yield topics based on the latest guidelines, and then a full 200 question online mock afterwards. So seven hours CPD on the day, and then you get the full mock, which is going to take you three hours and 10 minutes to do, and five hours to go through the answers and explanations. So we're running that for health education uh, east of England, for east of England deanery on the 10th of June. So the deanery will contact you how to book directly via the deanery if you're in East of England only. That's not, that date's not open to anyone else. On the 11th of June, we've been asked to run it by Health Education England KSS. So if you're in KSS deanery, they've already sent out an email to allow you to book directly um, for that. But we've got a few spaces that are open to anyone from any deanery to book for the 11th of June. That's a full day course, okay? 9.30 till 6 p.m. So that's normally 240 pounds. But I mentioned, remember the number 50. Use this code, AKT50. And you can get a 50 pound discount on that course. OK, so that's on our main website. Um, I'll show you later. OK, but I just want to tell you about that. And then for those preparing for the RCA this Saturday, I'm running a masterclass on how to pass the RCA 1.30 to 6 p.m. So a long half day. We're going to cover key tips and techniques to boost your scores, how to pick which cases, technical tips on things like getting consent in a quick way, you know, what kind of equipment to use to do your recordings, um, how to make sure you get good quality audio and video, uh, what types of cases to look for, things to watch out for, how to structure your consultations. All right. We'll also run through six interactive cases, two face-to-face -face ones, two telephone ones, two video ones. So you get exposure to all the different types. And this will allow you to then go away and 
start doing your recordings, okay? We are running our full day RCA course on the 20th of June, where we'll actually have simulators and there'll be lots of individual feedback and lots of practice. We'll go through 25 cases, but I would recommend you come to this. It's 150 pounds for the half day. It's a long half day, but you can save 50 pounds if you book by midnight tonight, okay? So if you go to our main website, emedica.co.uk, it's right here. Just click that and you'll see until midnight tonight, you could just book for hundred pounds. You don't need any code, okay? Um, after midnight, it'll go to the normal price, which is 150 pounds, all right? So that's this weekend, right? Let's move on to ENT. We're gonna do an interactive case. We're gonna do a couple of interactive questions. And I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about, um, uh, talking about uh, GP interviews for after you qualify, CCT, post CCT, you know, salary GP interviews and partnership style interviews, okay? So have a quick look at this, and then we're going to run through an interactive case. This is the kind of information you might have about your patient. Okay, good. So let's make a start. So now this one is in out of hours at the base. I, it's a face-to-face. -face. So remember, for the RCA and in the CSA, you have some face-to-face -face consultations. You have some telephone consultations. For the RCA, you can also do remote video consultations, okay, which are similar to face-to-face, -face, but there might be some things that you can't examine. But here you could examine. Okay, so this is the patient. I'll be the patient. I'm Amanda Jones. Okay, use your imagination. Um, and this patient that has been triaged to need to be seen in base because of this history. They had a sore throat and fever seven days ago, had some antibiotics for query tonsillitis, able to swallow, no difficulty breathing. You can see if they had difficulty in breathing, they would be sent to A&E, right, you know, directly. But this is something that, you know, you might see in out of hours. So let's start. Feel free to use the chat to type in what you'd like to ask. OK, so someone said, how can I help you? Well, Doc, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, this sore throat's not going away anywhere. And I already had antibiotics. You know, my GP gave me antibiotics uh, for tonsillitis. To be honest, they didn't even want to give it to me, but I had to insist. So what I think is that they just weren't strong enough. So really, I was hoping you give me a stronger course and maybe a longer course. So, you know, maybe strong, something different because it's not worked. I've still got this sore throat. Someone's asked, any cough? Um, not really. The main thing is, you know, I, I do have a bit of cough anyway, but not, that's not new. I, I, I've always had cough for years. But the main thing that why I went to see my GP is that I'd had this sore throat. That's what was new. OK, I was feeling a bit hot and sweaty as well. OK, someone's asked, did you take the entire course? Oh, well, I'll be honest, doctor. Um, I, I took most of it. Okay, someone asked which antibiotics. Oh, they gave me is penicillin. Um, and they told me to take 10 days. But to be honest, what happened was I'd taken six, seven days and I was feeling better. And um, you know, they told me don't drink if you're on the antibiotics. And I'd gone to a party and, uh, you know, they had champagne. Um, we were celebrating a friend's anniversary. So I just I had a couple of glasses and I thought if I have the antibiotics, I'm probably going to be sick. And I'm feeling better anyway. So I, I had seven days. It was only the last three days I didn't take. Okay. So someone's asked, do you smoke? Um, yes, I do smoke. Is that is that relevant, doctor? Because um, as I said, I do have a cough, but I've had that cough for years because of my smoking, I guess. Um, that's not changed, do you see? Someone's asked, have I had a tonsillitis before? Uh, not, I had, I used to get it when I was a, a child. Uh, you know, I had a, a few episodes when I was young, had to miss a few days from school, but nothing, for a long, long time. Someone's asked, any change in my voice? Yeah, actually, now you mentioned that. M my boss mentioned that when I phoned them, because um, I'm doing some work from home at the moment, they mentioned that when I phoned them, that my voice sounds a little bit different. That, you know, like the, the, the tone of it's changed. Someone's asked, any difficulty swallowing? No, doctor. The doctor asked me that on the on the phone before I came here. I'm able to swallow. You know, I'm eating fine. I'm drinking fine. Um, no problems with swallowing. 
Someone's asked, any weight loss? Uh, no, Doc, I, I wish I could lose some weight, actually. I think I've put on a few pounds over the last, uh, you know, five, six years or so. Any loss of taste or smell? No, uh, my smell sounds fine. The, the taste is okay. Any headache? No, not no headache. Um, just really main thing is throat's very scratchy. It's hurting quite a lot, okay? Um, it, it's a little bit difficult like I can open my mouth, but you know, if I open it really wide, it hurts a little bit. So if I've coughed up any blood, heavens no, I would definitely have come sooner than that. Okay. Someone says, how long has a voice changed? I'd say really for about the last five or six days. Okay. Someone says, any postnatal discharge? Oh, what does that mean, doctor? What's postnatal discharge? I've not heard that word before. Anyone else in my family got a sore throat? No, they're, they're all fine, to be honest. Yeah, my kids are fine. Um, have I noticed any swollen? Yeah, actually, it feels a bit swollen here. Have I tried anything to help? I've tried like saltwater gargles. Um, but look, I'm very sure that basically, because I didn't finish the course, I'm very sure that it's basically the same thing come back again. So all I want, if it's okay with you, Doc, could you just give me strong antibiotics? And I promise I'll take them all this time. And I don't know, maybe if, it was 10, 10 days last time. Maybe I need to take it for 14 days or something. So can I have like a longer course and something strong? Would that be okay? Okay. So I'm going to stop you there. Let's have a look at some of the important things to ask um, and what we've covered. So things you want to ask, you know, how long they've had it. Um, is it on one side or both sides, this sore throat? Okay. Um, how bad is the pain? How severe is the pain? Does it go anywhere else? You know, is it there all the time? Does it come and go? Is it like an ache? Is it sharp? Things like that. Fever, we asked about headache, uh, cough, flu-like symptoms, cough, coryza, that would be important. Okay. Drooling, that's a really important question. Someone had asked about that. Um, any change, and this is a question you have to ask in a sensitive way. Any change, has anyone, you know, have you noticed um, that there's a change in the smell from your breath? Or has anyone else commented on that? Okay. Um, any pain in swallowing. Sometimes someone, you know, they can swallow, but it's a bit uncomfortable. Trismus, so difficulty opening the mouth, they mentioned that. Altered voice quality we asked about. So, you know, have they got a hoarse voice? Have they got a hot potato voice where it sounds quite husky? Um, have they got earache on the side that they've got the sore throat, if it's on one side? That's a really important question. Any stiffness in the neck? That would be really, really important to ask, okay? All right, so what would we like to examine for this patient? So we've asked all of these questions, we've got that, it's sore on one side, rather than being generally sore. Okay, that they are a smoker. Um, they are able to swallow. It's a bit scratchy, but they can swallow. Um, something else would be worth asking, are they still having fevers? And actually, yeah, they're still getting fevers, it comes and goes. They take paracetamol, it helps settle it down. Okay. So what do we wanna check? So someone said temperature, ENT, vitals, okay. Um, lymph nodes, great, look in the ears, uh, pulse, blood pressure, great. So yeah, you do want to look at their temperature, their pulse, their blood pressure. You want to examine the lymph nodes here. Uh, you want to check for torticollis. So get them to you know see what they can do with their neck. Is their stiffness there? Is the range of movement reduced? Are they got any signs of dehydration? And then have a look at the throat. Now that can be difficult if they've got trismus, they might not be able to open it all the way. Right now with COVID, even with PPE, you might actually opt not to do if you haven't got full PP, you might opt not to do uh, that examination because of the fact that it could be high risk and aerosol generated. Things that you might see if you have got the right PP. So, you know, you want to look for, is there pus there? Is the uvula deviated to one side? Is there tonsillar shift? Is there exudate? Is it just generally red? Uh, you might see that you know, the, the breath might smell uh, fetid, okay? Um, let's have a look that this is what we see, okay? So you decide you've got full PP, you're, you're fortunate. You decide to have a go and this is what you see, all right? So what do you think the diagnosis might be based on the history, the examination findings that you're seeing here? Their temperature's okay today, but they have said that they've had a temperature up and down, okay? But based on that history, what do you think the diagnosis is and how might you manage this patient? So for example, would you give them the antibiotics that they're asking for? Would you say that they're not gonna have antibiotics? Would you, you know, do something else with them? 
Great. So lots of people saying this is possibly a quincy, a peritonsular abscess, um, and that's absolutely right. Okay. So this is a, a quincy, a peritonsular abscess. Now it's much more common. We think about this in, in young children and teenagers, right? But there's a, a cohort, especially if they've been smoking for a long time, that get this over 40s, and this patient was in their 40s. Okay. And really important to understand that they need to be admitted because they're going to have to have this, uh, you know, drained. And then they might need IV antibiotics. But certainly if you just give them oral antibiotics, what you can do is it's just master symptoms and it's getting worse and they might end up septic. So they need to be seen today, need to be admitted, basically. That's what we would do as GPs. We need to have them in. They need to have this drained. And then they might need IV antibiotics for a bit and then home on orals to finish the course. What we should not do is just start oral antibiotics just because the patient wants it. But something that's really important to think about here then in terms of interpersonal is to have an open mind that sometimes, you know, some people can get an assumption, and we do this sometimes in real life, right? If someone's demanding, they say early on, look, I just want antibiotics, stronger antibiotics. What are stronger antibiotics, right? I want stronger, better antibiotics. I want longer antibiotics. That sometimes you sort of think, all right, you're demanding them. I'm not going to give them to you. This patient, not only do they need antibiotics, they probably need IVs, but after they've had a, a, a drainage, right? You know, they're really unwell. Someone that's demanding can also be really unwell. And it's important to keep that open mind and don't decide your management until you've asked all the right questions, until you've examined and until you've actually got uh, a full clinical picture. That sometimes someone that demands something, they might actually need something even more than that because they're actually really, really unwell. You see, you know, I've had patients who are demanding antibiotics and painkillers for knee pain that actually have septic arthritis that I need to admit for a, a drainage and a washout and IV antibiotics. They were in hospital for over a week. OK, this can happen. Right. And one of the things you want to talk about is the potential because they might say, look, no, forget that. I don't want to go to hospital. There's all this COVID about. I'll probably end up getting it. That's the last thing I want. Just give me stronger. And that, you know, you need to highlight that. Actually, if you don't treat this, you could end up with full blown sepsis and that could be life threatening. Worst case scenario. OK, you think about that. Now you could highlight about the fact that smoking cessation is a risk factor that, look, you, you've got this and you've mentioned you've had this cough for a long time. And if you just say to someone smoking is bad, stop, they feel told off. It doesn't actually work in terms of affecting change. But if you link it to what they came for, you mentioned you've had a cough for years and then, you know, you've got this now, which is quite a serious infection. Look, let's get you sorted now. I really want to make sure that you've been treated and that you get well. But after this, you know, one of the risk factors for getting something serious like this, but also other serious things like lung cancer, like heart problems, like strokes, is smoking. So if you ever need help, we can help you. Do you see, you've planted a seed. They might come back six weeks later and say, I've been thinking about this. You know, I was in hospital for five, six days. I was really unwell. I couldn't see my kids. You know what? You mentioned that smoking can increase my risk of getting this again. I don't want that. Please, can you give me the details? I want to go and see the smoking cessation nurse. And that's how that, that seed that you planted weeks ago grows into something that bears fruit. OK, right. So just a reminder, our RCA course, a couple of people asked, what is the RCA? Is the recorded consultation assessment. This is the replacement for the clinical skills assessment. For those of you that were due to CCT by the end of this year, you're going to have to do this. Probably those of you that are going to CCT early part of next year are also going to probably end up doing this, but that will be confirmed later instead of the CSA. OK, so we're going to do this half day masterclass Saturday, 6th of June. You do it from home, 1 30 to 6 p.m. Um, we'll talk about you know how to approach it so that you can pass, how to pick your 13 cases, how to actually technical aspects of getting good recordings. And then we'll do six interactive cases that you can actually get involved in. OK, so if you book by midnight tonight, no code needed. It's just a. Uh, 50, uh, 50 pound discount. So you pay 100 pounds instead of 150. OK, right. Let's do one more question. And then I want to talk about interviews.
I'll close that there. So the most popular answers were E and A. So E was the most popular, no treatment needed, review in a few weeks. After that was A, oral amoxicillin. First of all, this is what we call a two-step question. You get the mark for step two, which is management. Step one is to look at the picture, look at the scenario, and work out the diagnosis. So type the, into the chat the diagnosis. What do you think the diagnosis is? What do you think is going on from this picture? In a picture, just always look at both the picture and the scenario. Together, they're going to give you the answer. Okay. So what do you think the diagnosis is? That's going to help you think about the answer, right? Okay, so a few people said blue ear. Uh, some people have said uh, bilateral otitis media. You know how rare bilateral otitis media is, okay? Common things are common. A um, couple of people just saying otitis media with effusion, okay? Um, one person said eustachian tube dysfunction. Um, so the most popular things, a lot of people saying uh, either otitis media or glue ear, um, and then a few people saying eustachian tube dysfunction. Okay, so the right answer is this, it's a classical picture of eustachian tube dysfunction. Okay, very common to get it um, either after having had a cold or something like that. Okay, or often people when they've uh, already had something like that and then they go on a flight. Typically, you get uh, this muffling of the sound. It's bilateral. Often you get some tinnitus alongside it. Okay, um, but particularly common after they've had an upper respiratory tract infection. So they had cold symptoms, then they were on a flight and it's there. So uh, eustachian tube dysfunction. Uh, in most cases, we'll just settle on its own within four weeks. So the right answer is E. No need to do anything, just review in three weeks. At four weeks, if it's not settled, then you could do things like giving steroids. You could do things like antihistamines, okay? You wouldn't give antibiotics because it's not an infection, all right? So the gentamicin option, the amoxicillin option, th these aren't useful. All steroids, if it hadn't settled, maybe in four weeks, you might think about, okay? Um, if they're not settled after that, then you send them to ENT. So this is a perfectly healthy eardrum. I'm just going to show you a couple of really important things. So the first thing is, can you see this light reflection? That tells us that the drum is intact and basically the light is bouncing off the drum and coming back at you, okay? You can see that I can separate this bone from this bone with a clear gap. If you can separate the landmarks like that, it usually means that the pressure behind the drum is normal, okay? You can see that the color looks healthy, it doesn't look inflamed and there's no fluid level. This is otitis media with effusion. Can you see how inflamed this looks compared to a normal healthy eardrum? Because, can you see the fluid level here? Because of the fluid behind the drum and the inflammation, there's increased pressure behind the drum. As a result of the increased pressure, can you see how we can separate these two bones with this gap? You can't do that with increased pressure. They sort of fuse, it's not easy to see. That's one of the ways that you can tell there's probably increased pressure behind the drum. So this is otitis media with effusion. This is a healthy eardrum, okay? So someone's asked, can you use auto vent? So remember, you have to pick from the options there, right? So there are other things that you could do. So for example, you can use, uh, yeah, um, osteo, you can use the things to sort of uh, use like an inflation, but ENT would do that. We wouldn't do that in primary care, okay? Sometimes people buy things over the counter. Um, again, we wouldn't recommend that because it's not evidence-based, okay? So other ENT topics, so ENT, and genetics are the two clinical topics that people do worse than in both AKT and CSA. So it's worth, it comes up a lot in the examiner's report that people didn't do well because most of you didn't have an ENT rotation. So other ENT topics to revise, hearing loss, interpreting audiograms, and we'll cover this at the main AKT course, Rini and Weber tests, okay, Meniere's disease, tinnitus, head and neck cancers, okay. Generally, the two-week referral criteria for all cancers are important. They often come up, okay. So I just want to touch on now, I apologize, we're running a little bit over. If I can have 10 minutes, we'll finish five minutes late, if that's okay. If we can have 10 minutes, just to want to talk a little bit about GP job interviews, and then I'll stay back and take questions, okay? So I'm talking about job interviews for when you finish your training, for salaried and partnership uh, jobs, okay? So I just want to touch on these. We have our CCT Plus course running at the beginning of July. For those of you close to CCT, that's a full day where we cover all the different career options, 
practical advice about how to do well interviews, how to write a good CV, uh, about how to negotiate your contract, about the money side of GP, about the different career options, about things like how to compare different offers. It's a really in-depth, a lot of practical stuff you're not going to get anywhere else. But I want to touch on this. What kinds of things happen in interview and what are the kinds of things that they might ask you about? So you can start reading about them. So typically an interview for a salaried GP job or a partnership job will be somewhere between 15 minutes and half an hour. And the kind of thing that might happen is sometimes, especially for partnership interviews, sometimes they'll give you a topic to prepare a presentation on or ask you to pre prepare a presentation all about you and your background so that they get a flavor of you. And some, for some people, that's quite intimidating because they're not used to presenting in front of people. And so it's important to practice. Almost always, there will be 15 to 20 minutes of questions and it will be a semi-structured interview, i.e. they will ask every candidate the same series of questions so that they can have a scoring system to show that they have a fair interview process, okay? Um, and then usually there's about five, 10 minutes at the end where you can ask them questions. And that's your opportunity to ask questions to find out a little bit more detail about, you know, specific things that different doctors in the practice might be interested in, about the practice ethos, about, you know, things like how often they meet for coffee, what kinds of things they do for fun. Because remember that when you join a GP practice, usually it's a small team. OK, there are some very big practices, but most practices are three to six doctors. My practice, for example, is only two of us. OK, uh, you know, there are some big practices where there's 20, 30 GPs. But in a lot of cases, a big part of if you're going to do well in a practice isn't about can you do the job? You can all do the job by the time you're qualified. But it's about how you get on with the team and different practices have different ethos. You know, some practices, they're very money minded. And for example, they will never use locums because they don't want to you know, uh, take a hit on the cost. And that might mean that they take less holidays each because they cover the road. Other practices, everyone takes 10 weeks of annual leave, the partners. They earn less, but they might be happier. Different ethos. You see, some practices, they will do everything that brings in extra income. They'll do evenings. They'll do weekends. They'll do all kinds of additional private things. Some practices, they won't do anything extra. They would much rather have less stress and have less money and have more free time. Now, I'm not saying either of those is right or wrong. It's not better or worse. It's just that if you're also got a good fit with, they want what you want, you're going to fit in there. Okay, do you see? So especially for partnership interviews, there's often two stages. So you'll have the first interview, so they narrow down the shortlist to maybe the last two. And then you have a second stage interview, often like you, you'll, you know, meet all of the team, maybe spend half a day at the practice, get to talk to different team members, and they're sort of getting a flavor of you and you're getting a flavor of them. Um, as I mentioned, you may have to do a presentation. You also might have to, I, I know some uh, interviews where they've done a bit of role play, like a bit of a consulting assessment to see how you might deal with the difficult situation. And that might be a clinical, but it might actually be dealing with a scenario like the practice managers come to you and said, okay, um, you know, I'm being bullied by this person. I need your help. How would you deal with that? And role play something like that to see how you might actually approach that. So the kinds of questions you get, almost always there'll be a couple of questions based on your CV. Okay, so, you know, your career today, any additional qualifications you've done, uh, the rotations that you did during practice, things you did outside of GP. There'll be usually questions on personal attributes, so things like your strengths and weaknesses. Okay, how other people might describe you. So it's important that you prepare for these things because they're common. Topical issues. So they might ask you about what you think about the primary care networks, about the PCN DES. If you have no idea what that is, you want to read up about these things, okay? About, you know, the fact that the new GP contract, what your thoughts are on, on the new GP fellowships. Often there'll be scenario-based questions. So one of your colleagues is regularly turning up late. How would you approach finding out why? One of your colleagues is underperforming. How would you approach that? You know, how do you prevent burnout? How do you monitor is stress building up? What do you think makes a good practice, okay? You know, things that might be about teamwork and management, especially for partnership interviews, very common that they'll look at things like leadership, about management and about how you might manage the business, not just the clinical stuff. Um, and so, you know, like they might give you a situation like that might be a genuine problem they're trying to solve. Let me give an example. They might say to you, we've just signed a lease on a new building, which is bigger than the current building. We'll have three spare rooms. How do you think we could use those rooms best to bring in extra income? That might be a genuine problem that they're trying to solve. And you might give them an answer that makes them think, OK, I can see that they've got some good ideas and I can see that they're going to be a good fit. And often some of these things are your chance to show how you might skills that, that they don't have. So I'll give an example. Myself and my partner in our practice, neither of us do smears. Neither of us did women's health jobs. OK, 
I've avoided it for like 20 years in my career, all right? So if now we're looking to hire someone and they have got additional qualifications and expertise in women's health, do you see how they could highlight that, look, I noticed that neither of you have this, I could you know, run smear clinics for you, I could do coil impl and implants for your practice. Because at the moment, when we need this, we, we hire that skill in. We you know, have a fantastic colleague from a different practice where I used to work, and we will hire them in as a locum at a premium to specifically run smear clinics for us. Okay? And if you've got those skills, you could use that, or if you've got a special interest or additional skills that you'd like to show you know, that you can do, you can use that to you know, highlight for people. Okay? So that's some, some things to think about. As I said, if you're going to CCT soon, um, our CCT Plus course will show you and cover all of this in detail, okay? So any questions, type it in the Q&A um, and I will go through that. Um, but up, for those of you that are leaving, actually, just quickly, a reminder, 50 pound discount on the RCA Masterclass, no code needed, just book by midnight tonight. 50 pound discount on the AKT course, the code is AKT50, okay? That course is on the 11th. We will also run our full course uh, in July, okay? And then the RCGP AKT Masterclass on the 13th, that Saturday uh, half day, is 50 pounds, okay? That's directly with the RCGP. Um, it's already heavily subsidized, okay? No codes or anything needed, okay? So just before you leave, um, do join the GP Training Support Facebook group. We'll send you the links for that in the post course. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for further videos. No session next week because I'm teaching the AKT course all day and I won't finish till late, but some of you might be joining, so I might see you there. The next session, free session, will be 17th of June, 2020. I'll see you there, okay? Those of you that want to see previous webinars uh, on our YouTube channel, all the recordings are there. They're all free to access, okay? So I'm just going to go through the Q&A now um, for the next 10, 15 minutes. Thank you very much for those of you that joined and stayed. Apologies for finishing a little bit late. Okay.